First of all, it's always a pleasure to be back here for a lot of reasons. It's so beautiful, and, and this time the weather is gorgeous. Um, I have a lot of colleagues here. Pauline has been a, a, a real force in mathematical biology. Um, I don't want to say for how many years it's been, but it's been a long time, and ever since I have. Um, I have five students here, so that's, that's also great. Um, and so thank you all very much for uh, putting this together, especially to Barbara and Dillon and Pauline for their efforts in putting this together. And Carla and Mark was for coming to be major speakers. And this is a special thing for me also because it's my wife's 39th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we could have a quick uh, yeah. happy birthday. <laughs> And I want to 
and not only give you some introduction to uh, how one deals with some of those sorts of problems, but also to explore what one can learn from evolutionary biology. So public goods problems are widespread in socioeconomic as well as biological context. The classic example going back to William Forster Lloyd two centuries ago was the notion that there were areas of land that would be shared by multiple individuals, maybe competing uh, for grazing cattle, but also maybe multiple use systems. Um, and compare that to a turbine valve, um, which is also a public good, in which individuals have to get together to build uh, something which is good for the population as a whole. In economics, this concept was formalized by the late great economist Paul Samuelson, who said, public goods were things we all share, but specifically, public goods means that my use of, of, of the good doesn't interfere with your ability to use it. So it's something like clean air. And so they're what's called non-rivalous, non-rivalous and non-excludable, which means I can't exclude you from being from having access to it. So this technically distinguishes them from what are called common pool resources, things like fisheries, which have some of the same features, meaning we all enjoy them and we all our, our uses uh, we have we have to contribute to maintaining them. But with, with a common pool resource, if I use it, it's not available to you. Well, the distinction's not so clean, and there are lots of things in between, which are to some extent common pool resources, to some extent public goods, uh, and there are various ways to make this basically continuum. So for the purposes of the list, this lecture, I'm just going to lump them together. Public goods, common pool resources, things we all use, we all need to sustain, and we may not have enough incentive individually to maintain them. So problems of public goods and common pool resources are central, obviously, to our future. And yet, um, if we are eroding our public goods, uh, this is a, a projection of re renewable resources per capita in the Middle East and North Africa. But if, if one could look at this for a variety of other reasons, and you see <coughs> our resources are going down as the population goes up and as our impact environment goes down. This a cartoon sort of feature from, um, from Beijing. Anybody who's been to Beijing recently knows that this is not imaginary. Pollution is an incredible problem there. Um, and technically, it might be what's called a public ban, in that we all um, contribute to it. But nobody got enough incentive to do anything about it, because you figure what can I do that makes a difference other than put on a mask? So public goods and common pool resources problems are also central in ecology and evolutionary biology. I already mentioned information, and I mentioned tumors, but I won't take the time to go into them more. Um, marine organisms produce structures that are sedarophores. They, they accumulate, they lock up uh, elements that they may need later, but those are floating around and anybody close by can steal it from them. Um, so iron can get locked up in this way and be available to use. Um, I had a student some years ago, Eduardo Zea, worked with me at Ignacio Aramicus and Herve, and Eduardo's thesis was on a problem that will seem very close to the fisheries problem, mainly water use by plants Plants in arid areas have to take up water. Now, if you're the only plant there, you may, you may say, plants don't talk much, but you do understand what I mean from an evolutionary point of view. You may have evolved to be a little prudent in your use of the resource uh, because the life history strategy is to survive over a longer period of time until you can reproduce. But if you're in a well mixed environment, uh, and you don't utilize the water now, somebody else is going to utilize it. And so you will, um, you will pick up much more. So what we did in this paper is to develop a, a sort of model that I'm going to talk about a lot in this lecture, which is put plants into competition that have different strategies for taking up water. 
and utilizing the water, and ask what's the optimal, and since here I need the game theory, uh, optimal strategy to use as a function of how well mixed um, space is. At one extreme, there's no mixing at all, and the water below you is yours. Think about it in terms of the fishery uh, model. And, um, and in the opposite extreme, everything's well mixed, and so anything you say uh, is available to everyone. And not surprisingly, this is the evolutionarily stable strategy, which for the game theorists is essentially the Nash equilibrium that we found as a function of the mixing rate, uh, it goes up monotonically uh, with the degree of mixing in the system. And this idea comes up over and over again. I'm not going to talk about but we've been doing a lot of work on hospitals' investment in antibiotic control and showing again that um, in bigger cities, where people who aren't restricted to one hospital, they're discharged from a hospital with high levels of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, they're going to go to another hospital next time. There's less incentive on the hospital to invest in controlling antibiotic resistance. So we have a serious data for that. Nitrogen fixation is something I'll say a, a little bit more about today. Um, plants have to fix nitrogen, they have to transform it from the form that's available in the environment to a form that they can utilize. They do this uh, through partnerships with microbes, uh, ribosomium in particular. Um, but if the plant, I'm not talking about agricultural crops, but plants in the natural environment, they fix nitrogen and drop their leaves on the ground. And if I'm sitting right next to it and I'm another plant that isn't fixing nitrogen, I can take advantage of that. So I can free ride. Of, of, of the nitrogen uh, that my neighbors produce without paying the price. They're, it's costly to fix nitrogen. It's costly even to have the capacity to fix nitrogen even if you don't use it. So this has been a topic of interest to me, to my colleague Larsa Dean, and to our graduate students, uh, starting with uh, Duncan Mengi, who's a professor at Columbia now, and now um, Wen Ying Liao, third student, um, is to understand the evolution of nitrogen fixation, similar to the, to the um, example of water uptake. How should nitrogen fixation depend on environmental conditions? Well, you would expect plants to fix nitrogen in places where nitrogen uh, was not in great abundance, uh, and not to do it when they didn't need to, if, if they were in places where there's lots of uh, available nitrogen around, uh, but there are some anomalies. And uh, for example, there are lots of places where nitrogen is limiting, but plants don't fix nitrogen. Why? And there are other places where um, where plants are fixing nitrogen. It doesn't look like they ought to need to do it because there's lots of free nitrogen around. So why? So what Duncan and I and Lars have looked at is the evolutionary ecology of nitrogen, of nutrient utilization, in particular um, nitrogen fixation in this case. And the general framework is one that um, we, meaning uh, um, Lewis Glassmeyer and I, have used in, in looking at some other problems involving microbial ecology. It's one is to write down a system of equations that describes the ecological dynamics, what we call trade-dependent dynamics on ecological time scale, where you assume organisms have certain characteristics and you just look at what the outcome is. And then you embed that in a, an evolutionary framework. So from a mathematical point of view, that means you expand the set of equations to add equations for multiple types that have different strategies. In particular, usually not discrete numbers of types, but a continuum of types. So you can find the game theoretic optimum, and then look at competition dynamics on the longer evolutionary time scale to see who, win, who wins out. Uh, what strategies are most successful in resource acquisition? In, in the work with Duncan, uh, the idea is the plant can take up uh, nitrogen. It can take up. It may be limited by some other resource, uh, with, um, maybe phosphorus. Uh, and the plant can also fix nitrogen. So this scheme is just to give you a, a cartoon of what's going on. But these are the equations that, that describe it. And 
don't get too hung up on the details of the equation. What I mean is, in particular, we, we made an assumption here, which is quite common, called Leibniz's law of the minimum, that when one has two resources that are crucial to you, and in this case, you are limited by whichever one is in shortest supply. That, that formulation assumes that there's no substitutability. If there is some substitutability among the resources, you use a slightly different uh, kind of nonlinear function here. But what this says is that the growth of the plant um, is whatever the current uh, density is, multiply times the minimum of the growth rates on the two resources, uh, and minus uh, some death rate in the system. Here's the nitrogen, which is being input into the system according to some rate, uh, and disappearing according to some other rate, then being taken up by the plants according to, to this uh, equation. And, um, and this is the cost of nitrogen fixation if you're fixing. Uh, and, and of course, the more you fix, the more you're going to benefit from that if you need it. Um, and this is the death term plus the, uh, plus corrected for the birth term. And this is the, 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 these are the dynamics of the other resources. And the two functions that are in here, f of r and uh, g of n, are, are given by this. This, the, this is the growth of the other resource, the point being that if you are limited by the other resource, you're still paying the price if you're fixing nitrogen. So the thing that that's the price for nitrogen fixation. You're not getting any benefit from it. But if you're limited by nitrogen, you are, you're getting a net benefit from the nitrogen that, that, that you fixed after you're fixing it. So uh, again, we embed this in an evolutionary model. I'll be happy to send reprints to anybody and we'll take you through this. Uh, but we derive some simple conclusions out of it. For example, if, if the if one ends up co-limited means you're not limited just by nitrogen or the other resource, but you're limited by both. And a co-limited nitrogen fixer will evolve if the non-fixer would otherwise be nitrogen limited. And in the question period, I can explain that it was interested why one gets co-limitation uh, out of these models. And Duncan and I have just published a paper, uh, well, it's now 2017, that goes back to the sort of ideas in the, uh, in the paper with Eduardo Zea, and says, what if we put this in a, in a spatial environment? Everything I showed you so far was well mixed. Uh, and this it explains a lot of the anomalies that are left uh, in the well-mixed model. Um, antibiotic production by plants or by bacteria it is another example of a, um, of a public goods problem. It's costly to plants to produce antibiotics. It's costly to bacteria to produce antibiotics. They poison neighbors. They give you a competitive advantage. Um, but it's costly to do that. And uh, one example is the E. coli bacteria that produce toxins called, uh, called colicin, to which they are immune. A lot of fundamental work on this was done by Bruce Levin, who I mentioned at the beginning, and his student, Lin Chow. This was some years ago. I think Lin Chow is by now retired. Uh, and the idea is that um, one has th these bacteria down here, colicin sensitive types. Um, these are the colicin producers that can poison the colicin sensitive types and gain an advantage. But when they tried to evolve these in the laboratory in a well mixed system, cheater cells began to evolve, just like I suggested before, that don't bother producing the colicin, but are resistant to it. And so they had an advantage over the colicin producers in that they still benefit, uh, at least in a well mixed system. From, from the poisons that the coals and producers are providing, they're paying a smaller price. They're resistant to it, so they're not affected by it. And they can outcompete the coals and producers. But if the coals and producers are not around, and the coals and resistant types are in conflict with the wild types, they lose out. Because they have no advantage over the wild types, and yet they're paying a price for being coals and resistant. So it's a non hierarchical competition scheme. Uh, and these cheater cells kept evolving uh, in Lin Chow's experiment. But if you put this in a spatial environment, that's what Rick Durrett and I did, um, 
look at all three types competing with each other, then that same spatial effect we've been seeing comes in, and the, um, and the non hierarchical scheme ends up with all three types coexisting on the system, basically chasing each other around. And this idea was picked up by Ben Kerr, who's now on the faculty at the University of Washington, and Mark Feldman and their colleagues, um, who, did, who put this in an experimental setting and uh, said, using this model of ours, um, they were able to do the experiments and show that this really works. That in a well mixed system, you can't uh, maintain all three types, but in a spatial system, all three types actually coexist. Now, having mentioned antibiotics, I should say what's obvious to all of you is that when we think about antibiotics uh, and, and the public goods problem, we think of the overuse of antibiotics in our society, both in agriculture and in medicine. Uh, and so this is a, a great emerging problem. We're losing the effectiveness of our antibiotics because of the overuse of antibiotics. Uh, I've done a number of papers with uh, uh, Ramadan Lakshman Orion and others. This is led by my student, Ailey Klein. This was published uh, last year in PNAS. It was the most cited paper in PNAS all year, which is uh, documenting the increase in prescription antibiotics globally. Um, pretty frightening, actually. And we found other works that looked at the uh, application of at the, the, the same sorts of considerations in agriculture. So we documented that, that my current student, Sarah Drumham, in her thesis work, um, has led an extension of stuff that David Smith uh, and, uh, and Robert and I did years ago, which refers back to the problem I mentioned before, which is how can you take advantage of the fact that hospitals may not have a sufficient incentive to uh, protect against antibiotic resistance, what are the ways that one might incentivize hospitals to invest more in infection control, mainly by uh, matching the investments that they make. Vaccination is another public goods problem, and we're hearing more and more about this. <clears throat> Why is vaccination a public goods? Well, I guess that's obvious to you, right? Um, it's that we're all protected in a society in which everybody except us has been vaccinated, and so the incentive to vaccinate is less if everybody's protected and the disease is not prevalent. Um, and so there's a, there's a free riding problem there. Um, I don't think that that's the, even the primary reason for the current increase in vaccine hesitancy. Um, but you've all heard about that vaccine hesitancy and, uh, is not quite the same as the um, vaccine refusal, but both of these go together, and there are individuals who are uh, need to be convinced or want to delay uh, the vaccination for their children. Um, free riding must be a part of it, but there are all sorts of other factors, thinking about side effects, that people uh, that have been influencing here, leading to the measles outbreaks you've been <clears throat> reading about many places. So we were at a meeting last month. This is Robert and Lops for I. He and I on the grant that Shadi Sagwa is actually supported on the grant meeting, which asked, how does this work that individuals, antibiotics and vaccines would have to have some similarity in that they're medical interventions. Why are people, why do they overuse, why is the social norm to overuse antibiotics, take antibiotics, uh, even when they, there's no reason to think they'll do any good, and to underuse vaccines? So we didn't, we didn't completely come up with the answer with it. Yeah, but I think part of the answer is that you take antibiotics when you're already sick or think you're sick, and you take vaccines when you're well. So that must factor into this. But these are both social norms problems, but where individuals are affected by their neighbors, and we'll come back and talk about that later. Um, another example from evolution of public goods problems are extracellular polymers. These are the things that sustain biofilms and bacteria, uh, like. Um, Pseudomonas originosa, or, or river of cholera produce, uh, that serve several purposes. In particular, they provide a matrix for growth. And secondly, they are signals for quorum sensing. And some bacteria don't produce them. Some produce them all the time. Some <coughs> produce them at high concentrations. Some produce them at lower concentrations. But 
Um, these all contribute to, to the field of, of quorum sensing. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular, <laughs> this involved slime is the technical term for extra cellular tolerance. Uh, uh, so we're going to show you some simulations of cells that can make the polymers, those that don't, etc. cetera, uh, at different densities. Pseudomonas originosa uh, produces it uh, at high cell density, cellular <coughs> tolerance at low cell densities. So what we did, and which means in work led by my former student, Kerry Nadell, uh, who's now Professor Dartmouth, is simulations in which one looks at the various strategies in adaptive dynamics. We haven't done anything analytical really on this. It's all uh, through simulations. But taking into account the spatial structure, growing the different types under different conditions, and putting them into competition, uh, one can see the growth of the biofilm and also as to which evolutionary strategies are leading. And, and the answer will depend upon things like mixing rates, etc. Now, in thinking about the applications of these ideas to, um, to the sorts of environmental problems we're facing, uh, obviously public goods maintenance presents a, a potential tragedy in the commons, an idea that <coughs> Garrett Hardin introduced building on William Forster Lurie's work. Um, he talked about the tragedy of the commons. This was a paper of about 50 years ago, now more than 60 years ago, I guess. Uh, and he said the solution to it is mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. He largely meant the role for government in that, but I'm going to talk more about bottom-up solutions. Uh, in societies, that, that mutual coercion uh, might involve things like insurance arrangements <coughs> that help to spread the risks, um, or um, in, in terms of vaccine usage, there are laws that require people to get uh, coverage. So I'm going to talk in the second part of the lecture from, uh, about how one goes from individual adaptations to cooperative solutions. And I'll say a little bit about insurance arrangements, in particular index insurance, which I mentioned on Thursday, and collective insurance, how one gets cooperation and the role of prosociality, how social norms evolve and change public attitudes, those eventually evolving probably into laws and uh, religions, uh, and finally how one goes to international agreements. So with George Pacheco and uh, Francisco Santos, Francisco is a postdoc with me now, was a former student of George's, uh, we've done work on, and I'll just take you through one paper to introduce you to the idea, the evolution of collective index insurance. And I know most of you weren't at my lecture Thursday night, so I will try to motivate again what index insurance means. If you're a farmer and you have a land that you're worried is going to be damaged by bad weather, you take out insurance. Then if there's bad weather, you don't have much of an incentive to invest in your crop because your insurance is going to cover it. But the insurance company may suspend you, may have to send somebody out to see if you really had damage, et cetera. There's a big delay. You can get around all of this with something called index insurance, which says the company says, we'll insure you against bad weather. Now that may mean you've had bad weather and your crop's still okay, or vice versa, but on the average it ought to work out for you, as long as you have the capability to be able to average over the years. Um, and so that index insurance, if, if the weather's bad, you still have an incentive to invest. There's, the company doesn't have to send anybody out to see if you're telling the truth. Um, there's no delay, et cetera. But there are some it, it, it will only work if you can do the averaging. So insurance companies offer insurance based on a weather index. Um, and uh, if individuals take out this insurance, um, it's expensive. But if they can get a group together, they'll give you a better rate. There are other advantages to getting a group together. So individuals are motivated to form clubs. One of the advantages of a club, and I won't talk about this, but we're looking at this now, is it allows individuals to, who have uncorrelated risks um, to average out those risks. Uh, so what's the model look like? We have a population of Z individuals. 
they set up collectives in, in, in what we did, they're all the same size. Uh, and within a group, individuals may be either willing to buy the collective insurance that's available or index insurance. And then there are those who don't want to buy the insurance. Um, and only a fraction of the, of the cooperators will, will buy individual insurance, and others will only buy the um, take part if, if the collective insurance is available. So we look at competition uh, among all these types. There's an advantage if you can get a group together. And, uh, and right now, for anybody who's looked at these sorts of models, one can take the equation for competition between the groups and write the equation for the frequency, which is called the replicator equation. And in this case, it, it, it works out very simply that the frequency of individuals who are willing to buy a particular sort of insurance is given by x times 1 minus x times the difference of the payoffs of the two strategies. That's very easy to derive. And let me just show you some of the sorts of results that come out. Uh, this, this is the case where there is no collective insurance available. Here, the collective insurance is available. And what this diagram shows is that if the risk is high enough, then everybody will take out insurance. But if the risk is below a certain level here, about 0.78 or something, uh, then individuals don't take out the insurance. But if the collective insurance is available, and by the way, this gamma, um, that's a parameter which relates to the free fraction of individuals who are willing to buy the insurance. So you don't have to focus on that. But you can see that individuals who are under these circumstances uh, bang together and take out insurance even at much lower levels of risk. Uh, and in fact, in this middle region, you get a, a buy stability. And what does that mean? We, we see this often in these sorts of models, which is that you've got to get above a certain threshold of cooperators in order to go to the better strategy. So if you're below, if you only have a few individuals willing to take out the collective insurance, it won't work. But if you can get the number above a certain threshold level, uh, the dynamic takes you up to the, to the higher degree. So I'm happy to send reprints of that to anybody. So one of the take-home lessons of this is that group formation is important. Group structure creates modules for better cooperation. Uh, I, I will talk at the end about what, what the Austrian called polycentricity as a mechanism to deal with climate change. Uh, and so let me uh, take you to another example of this work done with Avinash Dixon and Dan Rutenstein on the East African herdsmen. I, I mentioned this on Thursday, but I'll take you through the math here. The idea is that individual herdsmen have ranches or farms uh, in which they graze their cattle, but if I'm having a bad year um, and I can't graze my cattle effectively, I say to Mark Lewis, who's running a ranch uh, not far away, can I send my cattle over to graze there? And he says, why should I do that? And I say, well, working out next year, this table may be turned and we can send your cattle uh, over to graze with me. So we model this um, with a basic framework. There are good years and there are bad years. And let's assume Mark and I uh, have the same, are dealing with the same climates, but our weather may vary from year to year. Um, in a good year, a certain number of my cattle and cattle are moved from my property, which is the bad one, to his, which is the good one. We're each investing in two things, our land and our cattle. Um, land is a public good. Um, so invest X, you can think of as the private investment, and Z is the public investment. And the first thing we do is, um, is we sit down and we figure out what's the social optimum. In other words, if we were working together, what would be the optimal number of cattle to move over to maximize our joint payoff. And our joint payoff looks like this. Um, th these are the, the yields, the good and the bad in the two years. Uh, on Mark's property, there's x1, which are his cattle, plus m, the number of mine that moved over. This function here, and this z is the investment in, in this land. We happen to use what's called a cop Douglas formulation, this double power law, but th that's not crucial here. And this is what's going on with my property. Uh, so those are our payoffs and then there are costs and we happen to have just to make it when we take derivatives to make it easier. But this is our total investment. So this is the total payoff function. So we maximize this as a function of n. But now 
Um, Mark has to make the computation um, as to whether he wants to play this game. So now we turn this into a game, not an optimization problem, uh, and ask, um, is this a Nash equilibrium? Well, that's going to depend on his discount rate. He's going to have to figure out how much he cares about this year relative to uh, the next year. Um, and if it's, if it's a Nash equilibrium, everything's good. But if it's not, and it turns out that people uh, in East Africa, uh, we were learning, are using a very high discount rate, um, then he comes back to me and he says, well, I'm not going to do that, but I will engage in what's called a second best. So he didn't say that. Uh, he says, you can send me 10, 10 of your cattle, not all of your cattle, but 10, and I know next year because I can only send 10. So this one can, this, this strategy, what would be good for everybody? What's, is that a natural equilibrium? But if not, is there a second best equilibrium? Is something that I'll come back to. And one other aspect is that a lot of these uh, are related to each other. Um, it may be that um, my son married Mark's daughter, or he wants to come to a sabbatical in my lab, or something of that sort. So he takes it to account pro-sociality. I won't talk about that, obviously. Makes it easier to sustain this. Uh, another example, this is Lynn Ostrom, who was uh, famous for showing how mutual coercion usually agreed upon to come from the bottom up. Maya Schluter and Alessandro Favoni. Uh, and this is work we did on, uh, could, you can either think about it in terms of withdrawal from the fishery, it's very similar to the work of Eduardo Zayas that I mentioned before, uh, withdrawal from the fishery, or, uh, or Maya's earlier work on water extraction systems in Uzbekistan. And here, the idea is that individuals can withdraw either at um, the selfish rate, those would be what we call defectors, or at the rate that, that uh, just like in the previous problem, that maximizes the collective good. And so, again, we end up with a, a, with a replicator equation in which this is the payoff to the cooperators. This, this actually should be a small e. It's their own effort. Uh, they're going to pay off uh, based on their effort and the level of the resource. And the defectors um, get a payoff which is higher, but then they pay a price because the cooperators ostracize them. And so this is the cost function uh, which depends upon the frequency of cooperators in the system, which is the term that appears in this equation. So we have a second equation that's the resource dynamics of the system. And, um, and then we look at, we get a very similar sort of sort of result here. This is the frequency of cooperators. This is how selfish the selfish people are. That is how much more they take off that would be the, uh, the collective optimum. And what we find is, again, there are two equilibria, just like in the index insurance. If you can get the frequency of cooperators above some threshold, this is just a dynamical system problem, then you flip up to this cooperative equilibrium, which doesn't give you the social optimum, but gives you something better than every person for themselves. Um, we continue to work on this, largely led by Andrew Tillman, a student of mine who finished up two years ago, and James Watson, who was a postdoc with me, uh, to build in more realistic costs to the ostracizers and also finding the second best solution. So in this, instead of just looking at everybody for themselves and the um, and the social optimum, um, we look at what would be the best you could do and still get people to cooperate. So very similar to the East African herdsman problem. So a summary so far is, I think I hope it shows you that collective action can be effective if it includes enforcement of some kind. That pro-sociality may be an important contributor to the maintenance of public goods and common pool resources. And for the last part, I'm going to talk about how collective decisions are made. Uh, there's a lot of literature uh, in, in, in the mathematical literature on this. Uh, for example, uh, the work of, of Don Sari, who's known to many of you, uh, on, on voting theory, uh, and similar results in collective decision making in economics. Uh, I want to go back to where I started, namely these uh, starlings, and also 
think about decision making in human societies. And this has worked with Ian Cousin and Naomi Leonard and others that has been going on for a number of years. Ian was a postdoc with me and then a, then a, then a colleague at now directs the Max Planck Institute. Uh, and this was on the role of leadership and collective decision making. So we'll start with fish. That's where Ian did his experiments. And the um, idea is that we have, a, 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 I should have had a picture of the fish themselves. Well, they're, they're, they're. So individual fish either know where they want to go or know where they think they want to go or are paying attention to neighbors. So this is an individual based model and every individual updates its, its directionality and each time step t plus delta t has an average of its information vector g and its social vector. Its social vector is some average of its neighbor's positions and their velocities. We can vary that. And the crucial, and this is just a normalization at the bottom. And the crucial term here is omega. If omega is zero, then individuals are only following others. If omega is infinite, they're only following then they're politicians, basically, they're only following their own instincts. <coughs> And in the simulations I'll show you, individuals have different omegas. In the first one, uh, there's one informed individual who knows who wants to go here. Um, and um, all the other individuals are followers. So the white dot is the informed individual. And uh, the slug never ends up going anywhere. But if I increase that to five informed individuals, they get together on the front. And eventually, the group goes up and to the right. If we make a 10, the group goes quite rapidly to the front. So what we learn is, just like in human societies and attitudes, uh, animal groups can be led by a very small number of individuals. This is how fast you move towards the goal as a function of the proportion of informed individuals for groups of different sizes. Uh, if we look instead at the actual number of informed individuals, we find that as soon as it gets up to 5 or 10 individuals, the group moves about as rapidly as it can uh, up to the, to the goal. And think about that in terms of attitude in society. societies. Um, that was everybody wanting to go to the same place. If we, we've also looked a lot at competition and asked whether we get consensus. And here five individuals want to go north and five want to go south. Uh, and the group finally can't decide to split. So a crucial question is when do you get consensus? How do you get consensus? Um, and that's going to be important, obviously, in dealing with environmental problems. In the bird flocks I showed you, data, these are not our data, but people have analyzed the data and showed that individuals don't census over some spatial neighborhood, but they pay attention to about their seven nearest neighbors. And Naomi, who was a contributor, <coughs> and her group, so the natural question is why seven? And they showed that this maximizes the robustness of the group. But then, I raised the question in my student, uh, 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 Eleanor Brush, in her thesis, worked out the mathematics of, think about this as a game theoretic problem. How, how many neighbors should I be following? Um, should I be a leader? Should, should I be a follower? If I'm a follower, how many individuals should I pay attention to? Uh, it may be, this is from Danny Grubau's thesis work. Um, these are krill that are searching for a resource landscape. An individual krill might climb up, the, you know, use local information, climb the peak, but end up at a local peak. So sharing information can be valuable. And one can ask, what would be the collective optimum? And that's basically what not only did initially, but individual krill shouldn't care about the collective optimum. They could free ride. So Eleanor um, looked at this and asked the question from a main theoretic point of view, how many leaders, how many followers, what would be the group optimum, and what would be the game theoretic solution? Uh, again, lessons for cooperation in public good situation. So this is the paper that we published in Theoretical Ecology, and she actually found, not surprisingly, that the answer is not always seven. It depends on whether the birds are looking for resources, trying to escape or confound a predator, etc. So, uh, a paper I'm particularly fond of. Um, with Colin Torney, a postdoc, uh, 
and Vishu Bakal, who was a postdoc at Ian, <coughs> we looked at this for the, the evolution of migration. And I'll only say a word about <coughs> the paper of Guttal and Cousin. Again, what they did is they put <coughs> individuals with different strategies into competition with each other to ask what would evolve. And what they found is that the population bifurcated. There was evolutionary branching <coughs> into leaders and followers. So if, if you really want to learn more about this, um, this paper of Guttal and Cousin, 2010, um, it's a very nice paper. Um, closing with some remarks about humans, one of the things we learned from, from the models I've just been showing you is that unopinionated individuals, followers, are really crucial to the development of consensus. If you don't have that, the population splits apart. Um, so these are extremely important to the development of consensus. So in a later paper, Ian and I and Naomi and our collaborators um, looked at the role of what we call uninformed individuals. I wish we uh, simply said unopinionated because uh, that, that's a broader category. <clears throat> and we combined a number of things. First of all, we combined the earlier models that I already showed you in looking at uh, followers and leaders. Um, Ian did experiments in which he trained fish to targets uh, with, with varying degrees of fidelity. And then we looked at some models. I'll show you one of decision making in human groups. Um, and one of the things we found both experimentally and in, in the theoretical models is suppose you have um, a certain number of individuals who want to go to target A and a certain number to target B. Suppose there are more that want to go to target A when well, you would expect the group to be driven to target A, but maybe the group that wants to go to target B uh, is more stubborn about it. They hold their, their, they're less likely to change their mind. Think about this in the political context. Uh, the first thing we found, this is a function of how stubborn they are, omega-2 over omega-1. And not surprisingly, the probability of reaching the majority target, uh, which is essentially nearly 100%, if there's no difference in stubbornness, drops off. And the more stubborn the minority is, the more likely you are to end up with the minority opinion. We saw this in human decision-making models as well. Look at another way, if for a given ratio of 0.38 to 0.3 of stubbornness, if you look at the number of uninformed individuals, that is the number of followers in the system, then as you increase the number of uninformed individuals, the probability of reaching the majority target goes up. Uh, it's harder for a stubborn minority to dominate the system if there are a lot of followers in the system. But the system is more likely to fit. So, and if you increase the number of uninformed individuals enough, then essentially everybody, almost everybody, becomes uninformed. And the probability of reaching the majority target it ends up just above 50%. Uh, so if you want to get the signal, there's an optimal number of followers to maximize this, if that means anything. Um, here's an example of applying these sorts of ideas to human decision making. So model that we modified from Quepi, um, Peggy Young has similar models. So we consider a network with a large number of nodes, each one randomly initiated in the beginning. The degree of means the number of other individuals you're connected to. So every individual on this network is connected to a certain other number of individuals. Um, you can change your opinions for a variety. First of all, you have some sort of intrinsic bias. But you still could be convinced to change your opinion for, um, based on the number of other individuals around you or that you're connected to who have a different opinion. You're more likely to change your opinion to what your intrinsic bias is than the other way around. Uh, there's also a, a, a random component that's introduced into the system where you may just change your state spontaneously. And finally, the network itself can change. If you find you're connected to a lot of individuals that you never agree with, you may just decide to change parties. That's what this amounts to. And change your connections to other individuals. So these are the sorts of models that one can look at in terms of human decision making. So just in closing comments, can, uh, can cooperation
know, we go from these simple examples uh, and from Lynn Ostrom's work at the local level up to global cooperation. Uh, Lynn Ostrom talked about what she called polycentric approaches, in which you have not, uh, modules of cooperation. I showed earlier how, how group dynamics can, uh, can make cooperation more likely. This is an idea that goes back certainly to Herbert Simon, the Nobel laureate in economics. He talked about two watchmakers, one of whom makes watches from beginning to end, and the other who makes modules, puts them on the shelf, uh, and then assembles them all later. Uh, they both keep getting interrupted, and this fellow never finishes, because he's got to keep starting over again. But this guy, just like when you're writing a manuscript and you save your work, uh, only has to go back to the last module. So modularity reduces the probability of system collapse, reduces systemic risk, and it provides building blocks um, for rapid advance. And, and evolution has picked this up, and evolutionary biologists have picked this up, and uh, there's a lot of interest now in the demonstration that modules arrive in, arise in evolutionary biology, uh, which can then be put together later uh, to speed the evolutionary process. Uh, with Andrew Tillman and Avinash Dixit, we looked at this, and I, and I think in the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll skip over this to tell you the, uh, the, the, the basic agreement, where we looked at a structure of multiple groups. Uh, individuals have a payoff within each group, which is a function of their own investment. This is like um, what, I was, what I showed you earlier with the Hertzman. Uh, this is the public good in group G. Uh, this is the investment of individual I in group G. There's this cost function. Uh, and then this is the pro-sociality curve. This is how much you care about the payoff to other individuals. So we looked at this with various topologies. Um, and ask what is the game theoretic solution of this? When can you get cooperation evolving? Uh, we have a series of papers on that. I won't take you through the math here, except to say that what this term shows is that the public good in group G is dependent to some extent not only on what's going on within that group, but to leakage from other groups. So if we're thinking about clean air, um, if Vancouver cleans up its air, Victoria gets some benefits from it, not as much as the people in Vancouver do. <clears throat> uh, and so this has just come out in a, um, in a special issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, is what we do is we optimize individuals' utility with regard to their investments. We show that the public contribution can emerge because of local pro-sociality. <laughs> Avinash actually had a paper earlier that showed that for one group. And what we show is that local pro-sociality in Lynn Ostrom's approach can produce global cooperation. Uh, and Avinash and I have a paper showing that pro-sociality itself can evolve with parents instilling that pro-sociality. Uh, obviously, the topology of the network is important, and the modularity turns out to be essential. Um, and just a, a, a closing comment, this is work I mentioned the other day, building on this with George Pacheco and Victor Vasconcelos, my current postdoc, um, and Philip Hannum, who was a, a graduate student at Princeton finishing a couple of years ago. Um, we applied ideas like this to, to develop a club approach to international agreements, um, taking advantage of the fact that individual nations belong to multiple overlapping agreements. And so every decision you make is affected by your connection. If you're a member of NATO, if you're a member of WHO, if you're a member of the UN, etc. If the US and China um, make a negotiation on climate change, it's affected by their agreements on all sorts of other issues. So the idea is one has groups. These are overlapping groups. You can be a member of that group or not. And if you're in that group, even if you remember, you may decide not to mitigate against climate change. So if, you're, if pay, you pay a price to belong to the group, you pay a bigger price, uh, basically, if you're, um, if you're mitigating. And we write down the game theoretic dynamics of this. Uh, I think I'll skip over this slide. There, there are a series of equations in which one looks at the payoffs of joining or not joining the group, in which you look at the payoffs of mitigating or not. Uh, and based on this, individuals join groups or not, groups build up, 
uh, over time, and dynamically you, you may or may not end up with an agreement. The critical thing to look at this term alpha here is the degree of overlap, the number of uh, groups that individuals might belong to. And it turns out that the more groups there are in our model, um, the higher the collective benefit. This is the non-excludable public good, the, thing, the clean air that's available to everybody, the, re, um, the reduced climate change that's available to everybody. So it really wasn't enough time to go into that. But let me just conclude with uh, this last slide. Um, I hope I've convinced you that public goods and common pool resource problems represent fundamental challenges both in economics and in evolutionary biology, um, and each one can provide something that helps us to understand the other. That collective action can emerge from local interactions. That problems are played out on multiple scales, and I think Dan Cooney will probably talk about this later on today, that collective decisions can impose this mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon, uh, and then linking these is uh, crucial to understanding uh, the management of our commons, the greatest challenge, I think, uh, that societies are facing. So thank you very much.